Hi everyone, I'm Sloan from SloanBella.com and I'm back with another channeled celebrity video. This one is a very iconic American actress from Corpus Christi, Texas, who was known for her amazing hair, her beautiful smile, her choice in husbands, her cheesy TV show of the 70s, her iconic bathing suit picture, her intense, in-depth theater performance in a in a play that was written about a rape victim and her taking revenge. Watch her do that. That was what I was in awe of as a young girl growing up. I also, quite frankly, really loved her hair and teeth. I loved the look of her. She had that beautiful, um, that beautiful mane of hair, although it was 70s, so it was a little bit more of the icy blonde or the ashen blonde. I'm not a fan, just saying, but it's very 70s. If you were around in the 70s or a kid, it's the blonde that they used all the time, the streaks, the highlights. She had that hair. Most importantly, you guys are going to know her by that iconic bathing suit shot years ahead of Pamela Anderson and Baywatch was Farrah Fawcett and that bathing suit shot with that smile and her hair tossed back and it just went viral. She became a huge star after that that shot after that picture. And so I'm doing Farrah Fawcett. Okay, so Farrah Fawcett would be, if you can imagine, 73 on Sunday, February 2nd, 1947. That's hard to imagine, because I remember young Farrah Fawcett. I just remember Farrah Fawcett and Charlie's Angels. Wasn't a huge fan of the show, but absolutely loved Farrah, because of course, she was the blonde. Um, actually, I liked all the women in that show. But Farrah was born with an Aquarius sun. And what I found interesting when I looked at her chart, and again, when I'm looking at the charts and I'm doing a channeling, I'm literally popping it up on my phone and looking at it. Her chart spoke to me in such a way that I got very, very in tune with her psychic ability. And I am saying that with her. She was exceptionally psychic. This woman was an amazing um, medium, intuitive, she would have felt things. She would have known things. She would have spoken things in her childhood that would have, she would have been told to shut up in her childhood. Seriously. She would have been one of those kids that was totally psychic and psychically inspired and would have, what I call it is um, psychic Tourette's. When you start saying something and you're like, oh my God, I'm saying this, I'm saying this, I'm saying this. And your parents are looking at you like, shut up. Why are you saying that? And they can't stop saying it because they can feel it. She's that kind of intuitive. Um, I've always called it psychic Tourette's. Like it happened to me when I was younger. It's happened to a lot of psychics where they just start blurting out stuff and it's like, oh my God, make them stop. <laughs> anyway, Farrah Fawcett, oh my God, beautiful Farrah Fawcett. So as I was saying, February 2nd, 1947, what I noticed right away in her chart was that she had Mars in the eighth house, conjuncting the sun in the eighth house, conjuncting Mercury in the eighth house, okay? All in Aquarius in her eighth house. Eighth house is the house of Scorpio. It's the house of sex and death and taxes, but it's also the house of mediumship. And when you have a loaded eighth house, three planets in the eighth house and three major planets in the eighth house tells me that she got her psychic ability directly from the men in her life, meaning it was handed down generationally through her father's side of the family and the men she would have married would have had innate psychic psychic ability. She wouldn't have been able to be with them without that. It was just something that was in tune with her. So she would have been operating underneath underneath the obvious, so behind the scenes intuitively. No matter what was presented publicly, there was this psychic trail going on underneath with her. Then she had to add to the strength of her intuitive ability, she had Neptune in the fourth house. It was in the fourth house, not conjunct the fourth house. Neptune in the fourth house or conjunct the fourth house cusp is something I see in a lot of psychic people's charts because they were raised one way and it was presented to the world in a, you know, basically in this way. Keep in mind, her Neptune was in Libra. That's part of her beauty. She was appealing to both male and female. And in her house, they would have gone to great lengths to make the house and her home life seem and appear perfect while she underneath was feeling the true vibrations in the house. Neptune in the fourth often knows the secret life of spirits or ghosts in the house. They will pick up on everything, very much aware of it. Then, Here's the kicker, double cancer. Cancer moon, 
Cancer rising. Her rising was approximately five degrees of cancer and something seconds. I've forgotten it went out of my head. And her moon was placed back in the 12th house behind the ascendant at four degrees of cancer, giving her an added intuitive ability that she would have felt everything going on around her. I really actually liked her chart. I was like, this girl is one of my peeps. She's a psychic peep, okay? She absolutely 100% operated off of intuitive instinct. She would have empathically felt everything going on around her in her life and she would have walked into a room and known immediately, do I like you, do I not like you, okay? She would have known that right off the bat. No ifs, ands, or buts about that. Absolutely amazing intuitive insight would she have had growing up. I also feel with her, now cancer, what if I told you about cancers? Oh, so much. And yes, my son is a cancer. No matter what your cancer is in your chart, whether it is your sun sign, your rising sign, your moon sign, your Mercury, your Venus, your Mars, the personal planets, the ones that affect us immediately as a person, but it can still hit with your North Node in Cancer. A lot of people that I know from the older generation, her generation in fact, because she was born in 1947, and a lot of them have the North Node in Cancer. And then you can go back to the early 1900s, you know, 1915, 1917, and they're gonna have Saturn in Cancer. Saturn in Cancer, and you're gonna have um, the North Node in Cancer is also applicable to the plight of trying to find the family you connect with. You'll find a lot of adoptions coming out of that time frame, wherever cancer is, there is a loss of family. Now this can be a loss due to working circumstances, due to war, due to drug and alcoholism, due to death of a parent, due to whatever the hell happens. It is the most abandoned, orphaned, and adopted sign in the zodiac. But people go to me, but why cancer is the sign of family? Yes, cancer is a sign of family. They are the sign of family because they are looking for their family. And in Ferris chart, she's got the moon and the ascendant in cancer. Immediately from the time that she was born, there was a pulling back of the family unit around her. And what she told me about, this is, this is what I started to see. She was kind of sending me pictorial images, okay? She wasn't, I wasn't hearing her voice. She was sending me images. I kind of see them over here on a screen. Sometimes they go in front of me, sometimes they go over there, but she's to the left. This is my feminine side anyway, the left side feminine. So she, and she's dead. So remember this, when you cross out of your body and you go to the left side, it's the feminine side. I mean, it's also the feminine side and the death side. That's what I was trying to say. If you have a near death experience and you start walking to the left, you're walking out of your life and into another life, into another space. Um, <clears throat> but when I was talking to Farah, she was putting images in my head as a little girl and she was so super cute, okay? She was a super cute little blonde baby. If you look up pictures of her, she's really adorable. But she was showing me images of her and I'm seeing her hold hands around her. She's switching the hand. She's showing me her hand, but her hand is being passed around. A lot of different people stepped up to the plate to help Farah, you know, go from childhood into adulthood. Um, there was a disconnect with her family. There was the family unit and his presentation and then she's kind of telling me that she didn't get to know her mother that much. She loved her mother. It wasn't that the mother was mean or bad or anything like this, but there was a disconnect between her and her mother on an emotional level. Probably not uncommon for some women and their children, but I feel this was due to emotional issues with the mother. I kind of see the mother unable to focus. Like when I close my eyes, I get an image of the mother and I see that she's kind of like ramped up in energy and then she pulls back in energy and then she's ramped up in energy. I feel like the mother was kind of like a live wire and I feel like there were a lot of issues around the mother's um, mental health stability and it was presented in a different way like so that the neighbors wouldn't know so the mother may have had a little bit of a drinking problem or some other kind of problem that maybe people thought she was a little bit mentally off or whatever get in line motherhood will make you a little bit crazy there's no like perfect mother out there and nobody should be trying to do it it's like a very difficult job if you have kids raising them but Farah is kind of showing me that the people around her, she depended on them. So she made friends and family, very Aquarian-like, by the way. She made friends and family with the people around her because she didn't have her own family, even though she had her own family. She's talking about her siblings being great friends. She's talking about people in the neighborhood being friends. And she was kind of a precocious kid that went off on her own. She kind of was always wandering off. Now this is her psychic side. What I'm being shown by her is that as a young child, she put herself, okay, 
children don't put themselves, but she allowed herself to be guided intuitively. She knew she was instinctually protected and she was guided intuitively into circumstances and situations because of the level of empathy she had in her own like sense of self. Her being, her spirit being was incredibly empathic. So she went off in different directions. She found herself in trouble. She found herself all over the place, but she trusted her instinct. So if she went off anywhere, she kind of just went off there and then she was like, I kind of trust what's going on so I know I'm protected. Very good spirit guidance with her. She was always channeling energy, always getting downloads and always understanding that she had a higher purpose. And I'm not talking about she was going around going, I'm meant to be a great actress, I'm meant to be this, no. She was actually going around knowing that she was a spiritual person first and that her spiritual happiness counted more than her academic success or her acting success. She was extremely smart intellectually. She kind of like, she poo poos it. She's like, because I was pretty, people didn't think I was smart. They always thought I was dumb, but I'm not dumb. She's not dumb. She actually shows up there. What she's showing me, because I asked her what happened to her after the death, um, when she died, because it was very painful to watch that documentary that was shot by her husband, the opportunist, Ryan O'Neill. I have this saying in my family, and anybody knows in my family that I say this, but I equate all fucked up parenting techniques as being the Ryan O'Neill of parenting. Um, <laughs> if you're a man and you have children by more than one woman and you've like fucked your kids up, you've got more than one drug addict in the house, you are a Ryan O'Neill. That's what you are, basically a narcissist from my perspective. But I wanted her to tell me her story of being married to him without my judgment from what I've seen and what I feel from him myself. And I wanted her to tell me all about that. And I first wanted her to tell me about her first husband, which was a huge crush. I had a huge crush on this dude as a child. He was also adopted and I think he's a Taurus or he had a lot of Taurus in him. I just remember that. That was kind of the one thing where I went, oh, I don't know, you know, Taurus. <laughs> little horns. Anyway, she married Lee Majors. If you don't know who Lee Majors is, he's such an icon from my generation. But if you don't know who he is, he was a $6 million man. I mean, oh my God, the bionic woman, the $6 million man, you know, then they got married. Anyway, that was my childhood thing. I'm sorry. It's so stupid. They pumped these stupid movies out, but I really loved Lee Majors. He was kind of a, a, an, a good actor before that. I think he was on another... I think he was on a show with Stella Stevens. I don't know, way back in the day, um, a Western show, and I can't remember, but he was a good actor. He was building his way up till he hit that sitcom level. Anyhow, getting back to Farrah talking to her, I'm going to save the comments about the documentary and Ryan O'Neill, and I'm going to go into, she's kind of directing me to the Lee Majors because I went there, okay? Which makes her giggle and smile immensely because she had a huge crush on him too and she thought he was super handsome and she really liked being dating him and being around him. She's telling me that she was introduced to him from a friend of hers and that at first she wasn't sure that they were going to get along. Like she really liked him. She thought he was fun, but she couldn't really feel his energy. She's actually telling me that when she got with him, there wasn't that spark that she was used to. She used to have this like spark with people. Okay. So when she met you, she's like, she would instantly know that she was going to be with you. And she knew that she was going to date him, but she didn't know that she was going to be with him, be with him. Okay. So she's telling me that she didn't have that spark, but she had that sexual attraction and everything, but just not that soul spark. You know it, if you've had it, you know, when you meet somebody and you're like, I don't know when people can't feel that I've had conversations like this and it's like, you don't feel that like, okay, whatever, tune it out. I think some people choose not to feel it for whatever reason. I always feel it when I connect with somebody, if it's a soul partner. And I think that that's what she's saying. He wasn't her quote soul partner, but she absolutely enjoyed being with him, thought he was super handsome. And she enjoyed the guidance that he, that he gave her. Like she enjoyed his mindset about her career. He talked to her seriously and did support her career, but here's the catcher. She's telling me he supported her career in the context of how it worked within his career. So as long as she could do her career around his career, then he would support her career. That's kind of typical patriarchal talk from men of the day, back in the day. Um, you know, the woman, well, she could have her career, but she just can't have her career get more successful than his career. Or if it is going to be successful, it's going to be within the time frame of his career. So his career timing is going to come first and then her career. So ladies, what I gather from that and what I would tell you personally is get your own career and see if the man can fit in with your career. 
That would be my advice to all women. Never let the man stop you from making what it is you want to do with your life, financially, successfully, career-wise. Don't listen to them. They're not going to listen to you. That's kind of what she's saying. Anyway, and I'm agreeing with her. But she was saying that the relationship was like actually really kind of good. Like it was good for the most part. And he helped her tremendously understand her self-worth. He was very much a good teacher to her and she remained friends with him. This is what she's telling me. She was friends with him throughout her life. Now here's where her quirky Aquarius self comes into play because I'm asking her, why did you marry him and then not marry him? She's saying, I married him and we had so many power struggles. She's talking about the power struggles and no doubt, Look at the kind of man she's marrying. If you look at the astrology chart of somebody, Mars and the sun will kind of give you a, a brief synopsis of what kind of man a woman's going to pull in, okay? And the angles to them. She literally pulled in Mars and the sun and Mercury in the eighth house. So she pulled in super smart. What is super smart? If you're really, really smart, you can be manipulative. In the eighth house, Scorpio undertones men, okay? opposite the second house, Uranus and Pluto, which I didn't mention in Leo, retrograde. Hello, that's some big ass, kick ass, karmic power struggles. Her Saturn followed by Pluto in the sign of Leo, both retrograde, okay, meaning it's a do over in this life and more focused. Her beliefs, her values, and the undertone of what she wanted to do in her life within the context of them being in the sign of Leo opposite her Mars, Sun, and Mercury. Do you know the dynamic? I'm surprised she wasn't actually murdered, okay? That's, I mean, that's a terrible thing to say, but she's kind of laughing at me going, she could have driven people to it, but no, I'm really surprised. That's like a mafia daughter, okay? That's like growing up mafia. That's intense by nature, but I think it actually had to do, again, Saturn retrograde, there is a loss of interaction with the father. Even if the father is a good guy and he's focused, there's, there's emotional negligence in a way where the child does not get what they need from the father and has to go down their own path, Saturn, on their own. Pluto is a power tripper, okay? Scorpio's ruled by Pluto. Aries used to be ruled by Pluto until Aries got its own planet, Mars. She's got both of those planets in opposition. Holy shit, that's a war within oneself, within, within your beliefs and values and the way that you wanna live your life and what you will allow yourself to do and how, how it will affect you going from your beliefs to other people's beliefs, going to your personal money and your foundation, going to other people's money. Very interesting. As I said, there she posed, and I'm getting back to Lee Majors in a second, um, because of course he's dy just dynamic and fabulous. I guess he's like probably in his eighties now. He's got to be like late eighties. When would he be born? If she'd be 73, he'd be almost like 85. That's awesome. I still had a mad crush on him. If you're out there, Lee Ma Majors, <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> oh yes. Okay. Sorry. I had to say it. Mars and cancer loving the older men thing. Um, anyway, um, she had this dynamic energy, but the men she picked would have challenged every aspect of what she wanted. And look at the picture in the red bathing suit. Look at that picture. There she was becoming a sexual icon when what she set out to do was be an intellectual slash entertainer. And she was known. So that's a belief system right there. I mean, Obviously, Hollywood does that to every female because God knows we're not bright enough to be both attractive and smart, right? Like can't be, can't be attractive, can't have boobs, can't have a rocking body and not be stupid, right? Hollywood, God, and that's where they put us when they don't know what to do. It's like, if you're good looking, you cannot demand the, or command the energy of a room. But I'll tell you something about Farah being light years ahead of her time as most Aquarian energy is because it's ruled by Uranus and the Uranus in her chart was in her 11th house. It was in its home position, although it was in Gemini. Now Gemini rules media. And again, we'll get into the, the whole scope of the American chart being Cancer Gemini, okay? I actually feel it's Cancer Scorpio. There's two trains, two schools of thought on it, but Gemini's prominent 
prominent in the chart because Gemini rules what we call the mass media, your TV media, your camera media, even your social media. Now that it's evolved into that, that is all Gemini run communications. So she had Uranus in Gemini in the 11th house. That's where it would be natally because that's the natal house of Aquarius, meaning in the birth chart, the 11th house rules Aquarius. So Ferris chart is really hooked up for her to be a powerful, and the world word would be influencer if she were alive now. People would be following her big time. And in fact, Baywatch bathing suit babe, Pamela Anderson did follow her because, well, I don't know that she knew what she was doing, but I'm sure the producers were well aware of that. And they basically stole from over here to put over here because you know, they don't have a brain in their head to come up with something new. However, it was a good choice of uh, pilfering from over in this one because it was a great shot and it was great on Pam too. Okay. So getting back to Farrah, when she's talking about when she was with her husband and that iconic the level of her career after that iconic shot went public and went all over the world and just every teenage boy had that shot and probably every man on the planet. And I actually liked it because I just thought she was so pretty. I mean, even women like to look at pretty women. I mean, like, I'm sorry, you just do. But she was saying that her husband really taught her about her self-worth. And I'm talking about that husband, Lee Majors, saying that he basically sat her down and said, you can command this now. You need to command this. You have a mind. He always, she's actually acknowledging that, okay, that's interesting. Right now, as I'm talking about him, she's kind of putting her hands around him in my head, a gesture, standing, standing behind him, saying that this is a, kind of a, um, a sad time for him right now. I don't know what that's about, but she's acknowledging that. And she's acknowledging that in spirit, she's around him. She's saying that to me. I didn't get that from before or from this morning. I'm getting that right now. But she's saying that she always admired the fact that he was her friend. But I asked her why they got divorced. And she's telling me first that she kind of moved away from him because he became controlling. And I'm assuming it's that Taurus energy I picked up on him. Always so like into the rules and the regulations and here's how I'm going to do it. And I'm going to want this and very traditionally male, not a problem unless it's a problem for you. And she was an Aquarius woman. They don't like that. It's not their thing. So prominent Uranus in the chart, prominent, prominent Aquarius planets does not want to be controlled, cannot control, will not control, does not compute. Got it. So she separated from him with the hopes that she would get back with him, even though she's kind of telling me she wasn't going to marry him to begin with because she didn't think it would last. So she's going like back and forward. I think she was very, um, she struggled with it because I do feel she had very deep affectionate feelings for him and really enjoyed him. He was a mentor to her. He was somebody that she really enjoyed. She enjoyed everything about him. Like she enjoyed the information and, and how she learned from him. Like she really did. This is what I'm seeing. So when I'm looking at the energy, Farrah was like very much distraught about leaving, but she, she shows me this, like, I'm not going to let him know I'm distraught and I can hold out as long as he can. So the two of them were stubborn. Okay. Aquarius is also a fixed sign. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really kind of fixed, you know, um, cancer can be, it's cardinal and it's action oriented. And if you don't take action the way they want, cancer is brutal. After raising a cancer, brutal family member, cancer. Okay. Remember that they're brutal. They should be running like wars around the world because they are, brutal. So she had that double cancer <laughs> influence. So emotionally she could detach from you like nobody's business and not let you know what she was feeling. Go right into her shell, go right over there and hide out. But what she's saying is they spoke all the time and they hung out and they were still really good friends. What happened is he pissed her off. He pissed her off to the point that she took him up on one of his challenges. This is what she's saying. Okay. So what was this challenge that was presented to Farah? She's talking about her husband, how he had basic demands for them to get back together. Like, I think we should do it this way. I think this should be the focus of our marriage. And she had other goals for herself. This is the problem with relationships. When somebody tries to stifle the other person based on their belief system, which is not this person's belief system, which shows up in her chart, he may have been a little bit dominant and controlling over her too, which also shows up on her chart, but she would have picked every man in her life to be that way because it shows up in her chart. <laughs> so she was never going to really get out of that. She may have been able to live with one easier than the other. But what was happening is as Farah and Lee were in the middle of some kind of emotional spat where they weren't going to acquiesce to each other's love demands within the context of their marriage and they were going to go their separate ways, 
Lee Majors being the beautiful star that he was at the time and absolutely fantastic to look at, wielding power in Hollywood, having a hit show, all of these things, decided that he would do the dumbass move of asking his friend to ask his wife out even though they were separated, believing, if not testing, okay, this is kind of how I feel. Farrah doesn't describe it this way, but I feel it intuitively, that he was testing to see if Farrah would go off with another man, okay? And so... <laughs> Farah, being intuitive, being psychic, being insightful in a spiritual way, decided to take the other man up on his offer, driving Lee Majors bonkers. <laughs> what did he expect? She basically was more stubborn and outstubborned him, and she went over there and she agreed to go out with Ryan O'Neill, who was friends with her husband, even though they were separated. So it wasn't a cheating thing, it was a separation thing, but she was going to do it. I get Farah like this with her hands on her hips going, yeah. Why wouldn't I do it? He thought that I should do it, so I'm gonna do it. So she was like, I'll show him. Boy, did she show him. She's kind of snickering that she showed herself too. Now, I agreed to recite what I got from Farah about Ryan O'Neill against my better judgment because he pisses me off just, just in general. In life, he pisses me off. But I don't know him, so let's see what Farah has to say about him. Okay, so I'm asking her about the first time that she met him. And she was saying, I mean, he was a beautiful man, is a beautiful man. Um, he was charismatic is what she was saying. He was beautiful. He was charming. He was funny. She's telling me about his funny side. He was kind of a clown and kind of goofy at times. He was everything. She is saying she walked in. She looked at him. She knew what I'm talking about. That spark that was missing in her first marriage was right there, boom, and she went right to him. She went to him like bees to honey is what she's saying. She literally melded right into him. She knew she was in danger when she met him. Like in danger, as in her life was his life now and his life was her life. She is showing me that when she saw him, there are two souls. That's what she's showing me. She's showing me light and energy. And she's showing me the, them go into each other energetically, like, like two colors overlapping and becoming one color in the middle. So they were energetically attached and that was that for her. That was it. She never looked back. She got her divorce. She went over here. She never looked back. And I'm getting ice cold now, ice cold, because I'm feeling her energy come in. She loved him. She's asking me not to be mad at him. She's protective of him. <laughs> I'm still going to be mad. She's very protective of him. She wants me to see what she saw on a soul level. See, I told you she was extremely spiritual. It's absolutely freezing in here. Freezing. Um, I usually keep a heater over by my feet because when they come in, they just like ice me out. Um, anyway, she's showing me that when she connected with him, it was instantaneous. Her heart was his immediately. She knew she was going to be with him. She knew she was going to have a child with him. Um, when you feel that kind of energy on a soul level, that is what you want to call a soulmate. We have many in this lifetime, but when it hits you in a powerful way like that, it's not easy, people. I have so many clients that come to me and they're like, I want a soulmate. I want to feel that connection. Oh, we all want to feel that connection. But the reason you have that connection is to get you to work out the energy from a past life and you're working it out. Now, is working it out mean that it was always fluid? Probably not, or you'd be moving on, <laughs> just saying. And there's a child that wants to come through. Now, what she's saying about Ryan O'Neill is it was fantastic for like three, four months. It was like delicious. It was like yummy. It was fun. She's laughing. She loved to laugh. She loved to laugh. She's also saying that she got to be more free with him in the first few months of their relationship than she'd been in any other relationship. But she does tell me that she had to work around his moods. He had these like crazy moods. She He had just like weird, weird up and down moods, weird, weird, um, just weird, got to turn his back, go off over here moods. And she put up with a lot from him. He was punishing. He was punitive. He had moods. He also adored her like nobody's business. This is her perspective. And they started this love affair from like the ground up. He also drove her crazy. Okay. Just crazy because she couldn't 
understand the energy and what I'm connecting with to Ryan O'Neill I'm just getting it right now she's showing me the energy of her mother actually she's showing me I would have thought it would have been the father because she's female her mother's a female not you know the, we marry the father energy but some people choose to work out what the connection is with the mother I actually feel it's the mother's energy that was like this and the way that she's showing me Ryan's personality is is that it was um, it was blocks at a time of certain behaviors. So sometimes he was really upbeat and there were addiction issues and there were all kinds of like weird issues, okay? Um, not like weird perverted issues, but just like there were those, but in a different way. But what I am seeing from their energy is as much of a person as Ryan O'Neill was, I'm trying to say it really nice, as much of, you know, a flamboyant playboy who used his power in Hollywood in ways with younger women that I just, just think was foul, okay? Because if you remember the reports about him um, when Farrah died, and I do remember this, and I do remember it being printed, and I'm okay with saying it, his daughter, Tatum O'Neill, married Crazy Pants, um, oh my God, I forgot him, the tennis player, that crazy aggro tennis player, John McEnroe, remember him? Throwing those tennis rackets down like, like, like a baby throwing like a pissing tantrum on the ground, you know? Getting paid millions to throw tantrums. Part of the entertainment, I suppose. Part of his shtick, I suppose. But anyway, she's the one that married him and they had a bunch of kids and then she went to drug rehab and she went to family therapy with Ryan O'Neill, which was painfully hard to watch. Okay, given the fact that all his kids, maybe one of them doesn't have an issue, but the others have an issue. And the way that he raised his kids, just like three of his kids have an issue. One with Farrah, two, I think with Tatum's mother, and then one over here. I don't know who this one's with, but I think that one's okay. But these three, the last three, whatever. Anyway, um, when Farrah died, remember he filmed her through that? He said that she wanted it filmed and she may have wanted it filmed. And I'm going to get into her death as I go, but I have to say this. When she died, he's at the funeral. The, film, the funeral is filmed. I mean, it was, um, you know, all over the news and the press. Tatum O'Neill came out with the fact that her dad, her dad, this is her father, tried to pick her up at the funeral, didn't recognize her, wanted to pick her up for a date. This is why I dislike Ryan O'Neill immensely. That and that alone. I'm sorry, but I do. Okay, so getting past that, Farah is trying to show me. Now, what she's showing me is interesting because I'm asking why she found him so attractive. I can see from her chart the power struggle. I know why she went with him, actually. Um, it was on a soul level, so she had to do it, and she had to bring her son, Redmond, through. Um, when she speaks of her son, Redmond, she just, when I feel the energy of that, there's tremendous, tremendous sadness about that. And to be fair to Ryan, this is weird. I'm getting this right now. This is Farrah's perspective. To be fair to Ryan, Ryan needed a lot of attention from everybody around him and for some reason had been sexualized early on in his life, which is such a common story now. Why don't we just say it for all these actors? But he took attention as in adoration and kind of like sexually around like around him and he kind of trained his children to look at him that way so she's saying that that he's this is Farrah's perspective of what happened between Tatum and her father very inappropriate relationship no doubt about it okay so without getting into details or outing anything she's kind of showing me that Tatum grew jealous of his interaction with her because Ryan was really focused on Farrah at that time. Farrah took the power and twisted it around. You gotta give the girl credit. She did this to two hotties over here. But Tatum had an issue with it. His daughter had an issue with it, um, but Ryan kind of set that issue up. So I think in hindsight, her stepkids would know that this was set up by the father, so it was a manipulation. I'm getting the impression that Ryan O'Neill was a narcissist in some form and Lee Majors wasn't but Lee Majors was a control freak this is whatever okay whatever we're all controlling aren't we it's our lives we're going to control them um when people say that I'm like why wouldn't you control your own life <laughs> it's like you know I'm, just, I'm arguing with myself now anyway when she looks at her son Redmond there's so much sadness and I'm asking Farrah what happened after she died. We're going into the death conversation now. I'm asking her what happened after she died. What happened to her? Where did she go? Because her death was so painful to watch. And I remember watching that documentary. And 
I mean, it was okay in the beginning when she was looking for alternatives to her cancer. And she's saying that she made a mistake not actually going in sooner because she had symptoms. She's showing me her right hip and the, the bone in her right hip, giving her some trouble. So she thought it was from like tennis or her athleticism. Okay. She thought it was from that, like running tennis, whatever pivotal. She thought it was from that, but actually what she's showing me is she's showing me that that was the first sign that she had something wrong with her and she should have gone in right then, but she thought she could fix it herself. Nobody really thinks pain in your hip or pain in your leg or your knee or whatever is actually quote cancer. So she wasn't thinking that. That's just not what she was thinking. Um, so she let it go for a while and this was her mistake. She also tried other things. Like she didn't want to believe she was sick, but it's funny because she had precognitive insight that she may have been sick. And with her, her energy was very powerful and she wasn't actually expressing herself the way that herself the way that she wanted to um what i'm seeing with her with the cancer it was so if any of you remember that was so painful to watch to actually watch somebody's energy them not being able to let go of their energy on the earth side in their physical body when all you want to say to them is it's okay to let go but she wanted to see her son like that's a mother's love for her son and that that Ryan O'Neill is filming it, talking to her, and maybe they were both manipulated into it, I don't know. But in the beginning when she was going to Germany and she was traveling, I was watching it then and I was like, she's looking for alternatives, she's taking control. I loved her laugh and her smile. She had this just vivacious laugh and smile and it was really fun to watch her even though it was painful. But when she got really sick and she couldn't move, I had a really hard time with that and I didn't think it should be filmed. Now if it was truly her wishes, and I'm asking her and she's saying it was her wishes, she, this is the kind of woman she was. She was intensely in depth in a spiritual way. And I'm asking her why she wanted us to see this documentary. Like, what was the point? What she's showing me is that she was releasing karma, okay, for choices in lifetimes, balance. She was releasing balance and bringing balance through her struggle with her cancer. And it was very intimate and very personal. And she's asking me not to see it as sad, but she's asking me to see it as a choice she made on this side and a choice that was going to elevate her on a soul level quickly because she had to get where she was going and she kind of missed a path a while back no doubt Ryan O'Neill. Sorry, had to say it. Anyway, she'd, <laughs> she'd missed the path on the way back. And the cancer, the being able to show us that energy, she wanted us to intimately understand the struggle of the soul to leave this life and how precious it is. That's what she's saying to me. She's actually saying that. She wanted us to learn through her experiences. She gets quite contemplative. And I'm asking her how she knew, knows to tell me this. Like, did she know that as she was going through it? And she's like, I, she had no idea. It was so painful to her on a physical level. She had absolutely no idea, but she just knew that she needed us to know that that's what that was about. And many of us have forgotten about it because it's not something we're going to watch all the time. It was interesting at the time, but I'm not going to turn it on and watch that documentary. It's going to depress me, quite frankly. So I asked her where she went right after she died. And she's telling me that the freedom she had from lifting up out of her body, she's actually Actually, this is how she's showing me. So she's showing me that she was actually lying down and she's showing me getting up. It's almost like a yoga pose. This is what she's showing me. And she's lifting up and she's, so she's coming out. She's actually coming out. She had her voice during this is what she's saying. This was her voice. This was her voice in her plan. Um, she's coming out through the show, throat chakra area like this, and she's going up through the crown. So she's kind of outside of her body going up. She's actually showing me this, like it's a yoga pose to me is what I'm seeing. She's going up out through her body and she immediately crossed over to the Hall of Records. Now, the Akashic Records. So she's going over there and she was immensely interested. I'm getting freezing again. She's immensely interested in what's going on over there, like why this was happening, what this was about. She was desperately trying to search because she felt like she'd really screwed up. And that's when she read that her soul was burning off 
things that were not balanced and she went through the cancer experience on this side and that she wasn't following her path and she her soul needed to quicken up because she needed to go in a different direction. The only way to get her attention was to do this kind of how she's saying it to me. Now, what are the Akashic records for you that don't know? I'm not sure that I understand completely. There's a movie called The Investment Bureau that's out there with Matt Damon. Not that I'm plugging it, I'm not a fan of the movies, as you know, unless they're old, old movies. Um, before my time movies. But anyway, there, there's a few good ones. This was a good one. It's it's built on metaphysical principle. The character in that movie, Matt Damon's character, goes around and you'll see him in the library and, he, and there's like the FBI is following and the men in black, right? The, everybody's being chased by the men in black. You've heard this, right? The people, they're like, the men in black, the suits. Anyway, it's they're metaphysically speaking, he's going in to try to change the course of his life because it's in these books and written. So he's ripping out pages and they're trying to stop him because they have a goal for him to be some kind of political candidate. And he fell in love with a girl and it goes on. Anyway, metaphysical principle, this is what she went to do, see what her path was. Then she saw the connection to her son. And it's interesting because her son, okay, her son, and this is something, she's around her son quite a bit, but she's showing me the karma between her son and his father, okay, his pain in the ass father. Those are my words, not hers, but I think he is a pain in the ass. Anyway, she's showing me her son and she's saying that her son, that son, not to mention his other children, but that son came through for both of them and is as empathic as his mother. Farrah is incredibly psychic. Like I'm surprised she was an actress. She probably should have been a medium or a psychic. Anybody that knows her personally knows that she could really tap into the other side. I don't know anybody that I know of that knows her personally. This is where she's very vivid. She's, um, I know she was an artist, but she kind of speaks vividly like that. She shows me her son. She loved having her son, okay? She really loved it. She was unaware of the brutality that her husband directed at her child. She can see it now. She is showing me that her son is a teacher to her husband, to his father, to Ryan O'Neill, is a teacher and was brought in. It's really weird. Her husband, okay, Ryan O'Neill, her baby daddy, whatever we're calling him, he came in to, Farrah came to him to teach him about love because he didn't connect on that level. He connected from a very root chakra level, that's like the sex chakra, but he connected on a root chakra level. So he connected with people for what they could do for him. He was very opportunistic. And when Farrah met him, he met his match because it opened his heart chakra. Then he had a child with Farah, and he stayed with her and he had to watch her die, which really impacted him, even though he doesn't respond normally because he's incapable of it, but it impacted him. And their child was there to impact him further to help, to help his soul grow. And he completely hasn't seen that. He hasn't seen it. So he was given a chance to change. And he didn't change is what she's saying. I really, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to feel her son because he's here, he's alive, but I'm trying to feel him. And it's just like, she doesn't want to acknowledge that, but, but she loves him. She wraps him up in love and she's around him. She's talking about a daughter. I wonder if that son, I don't even know how old that son is right now. I think he was underage when she was passing. I, I don't think he'd hit 18, but I can't remember. So... He's probably like 30s now or something. Hard to think of, right? Cute little kid too, super cute. Um, really sweet, really shy, really sensitive. Really sensitive. The dad really, whatever. Anyway, the lifestyle, whatever. It's partially her fault too. She acknowledges this and she's kind of showing me that she's been learning on a soul level, the evolution of the soul. She's behind the scenes right now. She's studious, she's learning. Um, she's hoping not to come back here. These are her words. She found it difficult on the planet. Things were really fun, but she didn't understand a lot. She sees a lot now. She sees a lot. So a lot of contemplative stuff. Her energy is vibrant right now. She vibrates. She reads. She learns. She's basically been learning on the other side. So I have a feeling this is... <laughs> 
kind of an odd thing to say, but she's far more in depth a girl than you would actually believe. Really more in depth of a girl and person. And she's on the other side learning. She's still learning about soul things. And I feel like she's going to spend her time being a guide on the other time, on the other side to people on this side. But they're not tricking her into coming back right now. She's, she's telling me about a little girl connected to her son. I don't know if he's had a daughter yet, but she's showing me a little girl. So I feel like he will eventually have a female, a daughter. I feel a girl child's gonna come to him. I don't know if okay, he's Okay, I'm back, you guys. Somehow my camera got shut off again. I don't know if it was Farrah or one of the other nosy Parkers over there waiting, <laughs> waiting to take up time on the camera. Somebody just shut the camera off. I was like talking and it just shut off. Um, it happens all the time with the clocks, with the stove. Sometimes the stove goes on, it goes off. The power goes on and off. The fuses blow. It's like a daily occurrence. Anyway, I think I was talking about Redmond having a daughter. So she's referencing a girl child. If he hasn't had it already, I don't know. I don't really know much uh, much about what happened to that kid. Minus the last um, thing that happened when he was on drugs with his father. or They were both busted for meth or whatever the hell goes on with those two. Um, she's... She's basically saying there's great sadness over her son that she had to leave. But once she got the cancer, it kind of like took over the way I'm asking her to show me cancer because it's such a such an oxymoron in our society. We don't really know what it is. And I'm asking her to show me like what it is and what she describes. She's kind of describing, OK, this is what she's saying. This is how she's saying it to me because I'm asking her from her perspective, not my perspective, her perspective. She's saying to me that when we as human beings refuse or choose or avoid going down a path that our soul needs and we only have, it's almost like it's a race, but it's not a race, but it's like that. She's making me feel like the energy quickens. And if we refuse to quicken with the energy, there's kind of a stagnation that happens around our energy field. And if we allow that stagnation in, and this is how she's showing it to me, she's showing me like a spore, but it's weird because to me, when I see cancer on people, I see like gray energy or like the color gray. All right. I see it like that. But what she's showing me is she's showing me that if, when we slow our energy down and we refuse to go down our soul path, like we refuse, we're not going to do it. We're going to avoid it. We're not going to change no matter what we're going to be stagnant. Okay. There's something that happens to our energy field that allows, and she's showing me like, you know, those flowers that you blow and they, they float the wish flowers, whatever they are. Um, they look like little cotton puffs and you go, and then they fly off. She's showing me that. And then the spores land within our energy field because if we don't quicken our pace and keep moving forward, our energy defenses kind of break down and there's like little, little pieces of our energy that can fragment open. And she's showing me like a spore will land in us. But when it lands in us, it, it has a life of its own that's vibrant and colorful. She's almost describing cancer to me like it is a different life form as if it's come from a different place outside of the human realm. It's not really a disease. It's an energetic life form that has a life of its own. And she's showing me, I do not know why I'm seeing this with her, but she is actually literally showing me that when it landed in her, it is like a lotus flower opening up those colors, that white, the pink, the shininess. She's showing me that and there was no stopping it. There was no stopping it. But on this side, it's very painful and she's telling me that it is for the purpose. Okay, so it's to move us forward and it's for the purpose of elevating the soul in a quick fashion because we refuse to do what we said we do. She's kind of saying we stop or she's saying like you refuse to do something. So you push your foot down and you're like, I'm not going to do it. I don't know that you're saying that or you even know what you're saying. See, it's so confusing on this planet because do we know what we're supposed to do or do we not know it? Anyhow, she's showing me this, but she's saying when the spore lands in you, it flowers or blooms. But she's telling me that the energy of the cancer is coming from outside our atmosphere. She's saying it's foreign and alien and it exists as a different life form and it elevates. Okay, let me reword that. It grows inside of us off our energy and feeds off of us 
and elevates itself through our cells and then our soul elevates by allowing the interaction on some at level even though we don't allow it. That's how she's describing it. I don't even know that I understand. I'm just trying to explain to you what I see. But she's been researching a lot of it. What she did say is she got that sick in order to quicken her soul's path and get off the planet. That is what she's saying. She had work to do and that's what happened. Okay, I don't understand, but that's that's just what I'm saying, seeing from her and saying to you. I'm just describing what I'm seeing. Just the messenger people. Okay, also wanted to address this. She's trying to get me not to say it, but I wanted to talk about how I first really became acquainted with Farrah Fawcett the actress and it's when I was at Stella Adler and we were given plays to do and some of you know the bookstore Samuel French I don't know but it's like way way back in the day I don't even know if they're open anymore anyhow our teacher would give us plays and we would have to perform these plays in groups and I was given the part of Marjorie a character in a movie it became a movie called Extremities but it was a play and I believe it was on Broadway I don't know if it was on on Broadway or on off Broadway Either way, Farrah Fawcett was starring in it and she got huge acclaim from it. Now, the playwright, whose name I can't remember, William something at the time, cannot remember, some big long last name that I would butcher pronouncing anyway, but the playwright at the time, so I was told, and I don't know if this is true or not, but at the time was riding the New York subway train and a woman sat down beside him and she was disheveled and crying and upset. She had been raped and she started to, you know, voice what had happened to her to him and then she got off the train and disappeared and you know whatever was never heard from again he wrote the character marjorie without farrah fawcett in mind he wrote it so that this rape victim could get her vengeance and it is fabulous it was so intense to play for for just to the context of the story was so intense I had a hard time sleeping because it frightened me with the person that played my rapist actually frightened me he was that good. Farrah Fawcett grabbed a claim in the acting world for playing it because she played it in such a manner that people could see her intellect. That's the point I'm trying to get across, her intellect. It was an intense play. I mean, it's not a nice play and it was rewritten. It was rewritten, I'm sure, not to describe actually what happened, but it was so interesting because then she became known as an actress. You get the burning bed after you had all of those things after. So Farrah Fawcett was somebody who really started off presenting herself against her belief system and then became her belief system as in the strength and power behind her very powerful spiritual being. She says when I'm looking at it that there's something that's really um, important to her. She's saying, and she's acknowledging this as a mother, that sometimes as a mother, and I'm sure she's speaking to her son, that you can outshine. She's acknowledging that part of her son's problem was that her energy and her his father's energy outshined his energy according to him, but it didn't. She's actually looking at her son and showing me how magnificent his energy is and that he's a teacher He's a teacher to his father in this life. He taught her so much and now he's been there as a teacher to his father's bad behavior. She's kind of showing me that right now. So he's there and Ryan O'Neill is going to have to view his behavior within the context of his son's expression. This is what she's showing and he will be able to feel it emotionally. He will. This is what she's saying. That's what I'm getting. So weird. Anyway, that's my video on Farrah Fawcett. And before my camera shuts off again, once again, my name is Sloan Bella from SloanBella.com.